Welcome to Mayo Clinic Sleep Medicine Podcasts, a series for physicians, advanced practice providers, nurses, and other health practitioners treating sleep disorders or interested in learning about state-of-the-art advances in sleep medicine and sleep health. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Silber. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Maitri Juna. We are both consultants at the Center for Sleep Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Well, good afternoon. In our last few podcasts, we explored how isolated REM sleep behavior disorder may evolve to Parkinson's disease or other related synucleinopathies. Clearly, the long-term and hopefully the shorter-term goal is to develop interventions that would prevent this progression from occurring. How near or how far are we from this goal? To discuss this, we welcome back today Dr. Bradley Beauvais, Professor of Neurology at Mayo Clinic, who is both a board-certified sleep specialist and an expert in behavioral neurology. Brad, welcome back. Thank can you, you Can you tell us to start about the NAPS-2 NIH-funded study and how this is providing the groundwork for clinical trials? Yes. Uh, so the NAPS uh, program, that's North American Prodromal Synucleinopathy Study, or NAPS uh, protocol. It involves nine sites uh, in North America, uh, eight in the United States, one in Canada. And we're following uh, individuals with REM sleep behavior disorder um, every year with detailed clinical evaluations, neuropsychological uh, testing, blood samples, spinal fluid, uh, if they're willing, um, and then MRI and a certain type of scan uh, known as a DAT scan, um, uh, also doing uh, at least one sleep study to collect additional um, uh, uh, electrophysiologic data. And we're trying to uh, follow individuals yearly um, to try to better understand the natural history of people with RBD. Um, and so this is uh, like a lot of NIH-funded grants. This is for five years. We had three years of funding preceding that. Uh, so uh, in well over 300, uh, it's approaching 500 individuals actually now uh, that have kindly been participating, all in the plan to uh, develop a clinical trial methodology to hopefully prevent the development of uh, uh, Parkinson's, Lewy body disease, uh, and uh, uh, multiple system atrophy. Great. Now, the other consortium working in this area is the Michael J. Fox Foundation's PPMI initiative. How are they approaching this problem? Yes. Uh, so PPMI uh, is doing uh, several similar aspects uh, to the NAPS uh, protocol. They're not requiring that a polysomnogram has verified the presence of RBD, but they're doing many of the uh, same clinical assessments imaging studies, blood sampling, spinal mm -hmm. fluid, uh, mm -hmm. and we're working with uh, our mm -hmm. colleagues in PPMI uh, because there's, uh, as we know, there's millions, uh, perhaps tens of millions of people in the U.S. who have RBD. Uh, so this is an important um, uh, avenue for uh, research, um, but uh, uh, it, it's a good collaboration with the PPMI team. So the idea with both studies is to identify patients who may be at the earliest stages of a synucleinopathy, just with dream enactment, at least clinically, work out how they progress, what the course of progression is, and how best to design a future clinical trial to intervene and prevent progression. That's correct, isn't it? Uh, exactly. Uh, uh, and, and this might seem somewhat simple to design a clinical trial, um, but it's uh, proven to be quite complicated. Um, and one of many reasons is uh, many individuals with uh, RBD uh, may go decades before they ever develop any symptoms, or they may never develop any uh, symptoms of Parkinson's or uh, some of these other uh, disorders. So, uh, and clinical trials are usually over one to three year periods. So trying to uh, um, focus on those people who are at relatively short-term risk, that's very important. Right. So 
where are we with agents? Well, the first two trials of monoclonal antibodies against alpha-synucleinopathy to reduce progression of early Parkinson's disease have been published, and we should emphasize that this, these aren't patients with RBD. These are patients who already have early Parkinson's disease, and both were unsuccessful. Would you like to comment on these trials and probable reasons why they failed? Yes. Uh, so there's several possible uh, uh, reasons. One is perhaps the agents themselves are not hitting the target, so to speak. So they're not mm -hmm. affecting the key protein in the right place to impact uh, the pathogenesis uh, uh, of the disease. Uh, or mm -hmm. perhaps uh, they're being used too late. You would think that with those with mild early Parkinson's disease, and interventions could still be helpful, and, and we're still very hopeful that that may be the case. Um, but we've learned in the Alzheimer's disease realm mm -hmm. that uh, tr uh, treatments that work early uh, in the illness uh, work far better than later uh, in the illness. Um, uh, so those are a couple of many potential uh, explanations. So we're not going to throw the monoclonal antibodies out altogether at the moment. They're still one of the more promising avenues for prevention, I guess, if we could get a, do a trial earlier on. Yes, yes. And as you say, that you, uh, the odds, uh, there were a number of trials of different types of monoclonal antibodies against amyloid in Alzheimer before one or two eventually showed some benefit. So it may be a long process to identify the correct monoclonal antibodies against the correct target? Uh, exactly. Uh, and there's so much work that goes into identifying agents that have a high potential to impact the illness. Mm -hmm. And only after the trial is completed do we, uh, and unfortunately, many of these ha are, have negative results, do we understand in retrospect, okay, now we better understand why mm -hmm those specific mm -hmm. ones didn't work. But that's still a very important learning process. Obviously, we want all of these trials to be positive, but unfortunately, many are not. Right. Um, again, there's a paradox, isn't there? We want to treat people in a trials as early as possible, um, but when we take them very early in the course of the illness, as you say, they may not progress during the time course of the trial. Whereas if we take people with a high probability of progressing soon, because they've got other symptoms, not just RBD, maybe difficulty with smell and earliest soft signs of motor dysfunction, then maybe we're too late already. So it's, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah, uh, the, of trying to find that so-called sweet spot uh, for uh, mm -hmm. clinical trials. And uh, if these trials are proven to be effective, we very likely will then back up and then begin these mm -hmm. interventions even earlier in the course. So people with, uh, for example, RBD that don't have any soft signs mm -hmm. in the hope that uh, they would be even more effective long-term. Right. So monoclonal antibodies clearly is one way to go and it's the way the alzheimer people put a huge amount of effort and t into and with some success are there other classes of drugs that we should be considering testing um, definitely uh, there's uh, clear evidence that the immune system is involved in uh, parkinson's and related disorders uh, and in fact there is a trial in people with RBD that is beginning very, very soon. Um, uh, it's one of the first large scale RBD trials that are uh, that's beginning uh, in the US uh, using an agent that affects the immune system. Um, exercise, and there's a lot of interest in exercise as potentially delaying the onset or preventing uh, the development of uh, Parkinson's and related disorders. Um, there's also uh, this concept of autophagy, which is where cells normally take proteins that are uh, being used for various reasons, uh, but then the normal life cycle of those proteins uh, need to be degraded. But that de degradation of these proteins is hampered, or the, the end products uh, then become toxic. And so trying to impact that aspect of uh, cellular activity. So there's a lot of potential targets from an intervention standpoint, um, not just uh, solely focused on the synuclein protein. 
Right. Um, now, do you put on your thinking cap here? Um, what do you think? Are these trials that are for sure going to come, are going to be all industry funded? Are they going to be NIH funded? Are they going to be um, combinations of um, NIH and industry? How do you envisage these things happening? It, probably a combination. Uh, some may be industry um, uh, funded completely. It looks like um, many that are being planned, including the one that's uh, being um, uh, started uh, very soon, is a public-private partnership. And so there's federal funding along with industry funding, uh, donor funding. So it's a combination of uh, uh, funding because these are not inexpensive uh, trials. These are typically uh, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars for a single trial. Yes, I mean, especially if one's going to be looking at actual synuclein measurements, CSF, skin biopsies, whatever, scans, I mean, hugely expensive. Um, the Ideally, we would really like this to move to a platform model of trials, wouldn't we, where we can rapidly test an agent, doesn't work, move to another agent using the same subjects. That would be the ideal, wouldn't it? Uh, it would, and that's exactly uh, one of the platforms that uh, uh, is uh, being developed. So um, uh, this uh, with PPMI, with uh, NAPS, uh, 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 can a spectrum of agents, two, three, or four agents, be studied simultaneously with a small placebo group? Um, that's uh, um, one of the most uh, uh, efficient and shortest time frame and least expensive, you know, th these are still expensive, but uh, least expensive uh, ways to go. Um, and so that planning of a platform trial is in progress right now. Well, that's all very exciting. Um, I know it's going to take some time still, but I think um, we can hope for progress in, you know, not maybe the near future, but in the intermediate future, we may have some solutions. So thank you, Brad, for being our guest um, on the set of podcasts. What final messages would you like to leave with our listeners? Uh Maybe uh, really emphasizing the optimism. Uh, you know, we've learned about RBD as a human disorder back in the 1980s, and it's taken a while, but we're at the cusp of having interventions that truly may delay the onset or prevent the development of uh, uh, disorders like Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia. Uh, and so um, uh, over the next few years, this is going to be very exciting from a scientific uh, perspective. Well, thank you so much. Brad and I have worked together for many years in this area. I don't think you'll mind me saying that when he was my sleep fellow dec several decades ago, he came up with the idea that maybe REM sleep behavior disorder plus dementia indicated that the diagnosis was Lewy body dementia rather than Alzheimer's disease. And we did a study to prove it. And a lot of things started then. And I'm delighted, Brad, that your career has evolved into um, this extensive research on this area and that you're one of the leaders in the field now. So thank you for part what you're doing and for participating. Thanks so much, Mike. And it really reflects the, the wonderful mentors uh, that we have at Mayo Clinic. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If so, please tune in again through wherever you receive your podcasts as we discuss further topics in sleep medicine and sleep health. Thank you. Thank you.